Good morning and welcome back. Today I thought we would take a look at a split cross, sometimes simply referred to as a blacksmith's cross. And in the U.S. a lot of people refer to it as a Friedrich's cross because Christoph Friedrich demonstrated this technique at some point and the ripple effect from that demonstration carried the name Friedrich's cross all across the country. Whether he invented the thing or not, I don't know, probably not. It seems like it's a pretty old concept been around for a while. So we're going to take a so we're going to take a look at this and we are going to make a simple cross out of a single bar of steel and instead of any welding, riveting, anything like that, it's all done by splitting. Now we've looked at this technique before. We have made a trivet actually in two different videos. We did a prototype of this in a video just for the YouTube channel here and this trivet was made as part of a Rocky Mountain Smiths demo. And I'll try to put some form of a link up here in this corner. Maybe I'll create a playlist just for making trivets or something like this so you can find both of those videos easily. Again, there are no welds. There are no rivets. There's only one bar used. Nothing is cut apart. It's simply split down the middle from two ends and then unfolded. Sounds kind of confusing and it seems like magic until you actually do it yourself. I've taken a little piece of rubber, actually a piece of rubber floor matting that I've had left over from doing the power hammer installation, and I've cut it on the bandsaw to create the splits. So let's see what this really does when you open it up. So here's our bar. In practice, we'll actually take this and cut it with a chisel from both sides, and I'll explain why I think that's the preferred method. This was done on a bandsaw. But if you open the splits up from either end, because they are on opposite flats and they overlap in the middle, what you end up with then, hope my hand's not in your way, is this very interesting open section in the middle, a nice little diamond section, although you can forge it around like we did with the trivet. And that's what makes this cross unique. I have several of these handled chisels or hot cuts, however you want to call them, and they have different profiles. I've got this one that's fairly skinny, which is great for hot work, but not so good for doing cold. This one's shorter, fatter, and has a stubbier bevel on it, so it's going to hold up better for this cold work. So I'm going to use it to start with, and I'm going to go ahead and do this under the treadle hammer. We'll do a lot of this at the anvil just to show you don't need the treadle hammer. But I'm going to get through this fairly quickly so we can get on to the hot work, which is the interesting part. Make sure you put the stop in if you're using a handheld tool. So with a nice layout done cold, we should be able to drop a chisel right back into the same mark. I'm going to start with this handheld curved chisel. See, should go right in the same mark. That'll be our ending point on the lower leg. It'll just be a matter of repeating all this until we get through both sides. You should do one heat from one side, turn it over, do a heat from the other side so that you meet right in the middle and there'll be less deformity when you're all done. So with that in mind, we will turn this over and do the same thing from the back side. Or the opposite side. I guess it's not actually the back in this case. You 
can certainly do this under the treadle hammer. You could do it under a power hammer, but boy is it easy to mess up something like this trying to do it under the power hammer. Just up to your comfort level. And then you could probably set it up to do it under the fly press, but I don't have the tools set up to do it because it's not something I do often enough. I think we're going to keep working on this end. We'll go back and forth until we break through here. You can see i got a little bit of a misalignment. Not the end of the world, but it'd be nice if I didn't. This is just a matter of being persistent and working back and forth until you come close to cutting through. I'm not going to cut all the way through where the split between the two pieces occurs or where the diamond shape occurs until I am almost through with all four sides. But down here where they don't cross, it doesn't hurt anything. This just gets me done with this curved chisel so I can go on and do other things. Go on and just use a straight chisel for the rest of this. But I want to work all four sides here at the intersection alternately so it splits right in the center all at the same time, ideally.
Now as you cut, start to cut through this, be careful not to go all the way into your anvil. If you don't think you've got that much control over your hammer swing, put a soft plate down. Probably harder on your chisel than it is the anvil, but it's not good for either one. And you can see that's already splitting at this end. Also watch inside the split. If you start to see a hump on one side or the other, your cuts aren't lining up and you may need to tip the chisel just a little bit. But that's one side already starting to split. So we're very close to being through. As things start to split open, it gets really hard to keep things straight and in control. All the little bevels from the chisel are sliding past each other in different directions. But just do the best you can. Inevitably, there's going to be some little burrs on the inside. You just have to try to correct those with a file or grinder later. Particularly big one right here that I think we can probably chisel off. I don't know if you can see it in the camera or not. We want to come back from this side and make sure that's cut all the way through and then we'll be ready to open it. We can do some more cleaning up after it's open and we can get into that split a little bit. But for the most part, I think this is all cut open. Let's see a little daylight, a little bit about the last eighth of an inch or so. And that will be easy to clean up later. So the next thing we want to do is actually open this. And some of this happens through spreading with this big hardy. They could probably put it in a vise and use your chisel to start spreading it. And some of it happens just by bending it over the edge of the anvil. place where the open hearth of a coal forge might be nice because it's easier to get this in when it's not completely open. That's also something to be aware of when you have it completely open, will it fit back in the door of your gas forge? If not, again, an open hearth coal, coke, or charcoal forge makes some of these things a lot more reasonable. So this one is small enough, I know it's going to fit back in the door of my forge, but think ahead. You could also use a torch to heat up where it needs to bend at this point if you needed to. But as it opens up, it starts to get a little bit easier to mess with. Now as a result of doing your chiseling, you end up with a very nice bevel here. So be aware of that and try not to flatten that out when you are straightening this and messing with it. 
because that's part of the reason we chisel cut this. But that gives you an idea how that opens up. Now there will be a fair amount of fiddling. I think I may get in here with another chisel and clean some of this up just to make sure it looks just right. And there will be some filing. There's always some inevitable rag and raggedy stuff there that needs to be cleaned up and a file is usually the best way to get in here. Again, I'm trying to be careful of those bevels, but I want to get the cross evened up. Now, it looks like my measurements are off somewhere. I ended up with my side legs a little bit longer than the top leg. Because there's nothing done with these ends here yet, it's easy to cut them off, make them all the same, and then we'll adapt. But that's a good reason to do test pieces if you're going to make these as a gift item or production run, if they're for a custom order, something like that. Do some test pieces, figure out exactly what your dimensions are, write them down, and then you know what to do the next time. So I set a pair of dividers to the shorter of the three legs. Just going to mark this so I can cut it off. When I'm done, I'm going to upset these a little bit to make them look better so it doesn't hurt that I'm cutting them off. And it's interesting, this one's not quite the same as this, so something is off in here a little bit, but I think we'll be able to deal with that. Next thing I want to do is go ahead and file the inside of this. This is always the roughest part and the hardest to get to. And mostly it's just to make sure there's nothing that'll cut anybody. People want to pick these up and hold them and look at them closer. So you don't want to hurt somebody. file enough to get rid of any sharp spots but sometimes that means you got to file it completely clean but if possible I want to leave facets from the hammer in here and I may go back and clean up these ridge lines with a hammer and that'll recreate some of that but the little reflection reflections of light and shadow are part of what make this interesting now I personally like these bevels all be on the same side so there's a definite front and a back. If that doesn't matter to you, then you don't have to worry about it. So I'm going to actually reforge the bevel, kind of a faux bevel I guess. Well, it's a real bevel, but it's not the natural one that the chisel left. The natural chisel bevel I leave here and here, and this one I'm going to push it to the other side as much as I can. I just think that looks better in the long run. It's just an artistic decision. Do whatever you want with your cross. I'll do that to both sides. I suppose if I did a lot of these crosses, I'd make a little bottom switch that just did that for me, but since I don't... You can also work it from the back. It's 
does unfortunately make the arms a little thinner. I should have done this before I cut them off. But that pretty much gets what I want there. Now the big thing is try to get everything in a line. Depends on how funky you want your cross to look. Now I've got a little twist down here, so I'm going to take that out. Pretty easy to just hold it in the vise. And these tongs are just fine for checking that twist and getting it out of there. So the last thing I want to do to the cross itself is go ahead and upset these ends a little bit just to make it look a little bit more refined and finished. I think this is easiest to just do with a torch. You just heat it about the last quarter inch or so. And I want to bring the upsets to the front of the cross as well. Again, that's just an aesthetic preference I have. Try it both ways and see what you like. Doesn't really need a lot of upset to be an interesting effect. As far as that one wants to go. Well, it's time to just do a last little straightening on this. Make sure I didn't bow anything too far out of alignment doing that. This is the kind of thing that you can fiddle, fuss, and cuss till the cows come home, so to speak. I don't have any cows though, so maybe I don't have to worry about that. But anyways, get it as straight as you want it. Again, it might look good a little bit funky depending on what it is you're doing with it. But that's really all the cross needs.
Now that's it for the cross portion of this project. You can do whatever you want with these crosses. I've made them so that they hang on the wall. I've made them with iron bases. I've made them with wooden bases. You could probably make a stone base if you've got a way to drill a nice clean hole in a piece of rock. Lots of options for a base. If, if you'd like to see me do a forged iron base for this, we can do that in a day or two. It's really up to you folks out there. That'll probably be a short video. It's just a piece of plate with a hole punched in it, a tenon forged on the end of the cross, and pretty much that's it. Now I used a handled hot cut to do most of the work on this cross. You could use a handheld chisel if you want to, if that's all you have. No reason not to do it that way. It works perfectly fine. You can even do these with an angle grinder and a cutoff blade or on a bandsaw, but you don't get that nice bevel. And even though I pushed that bevel from one side to the other so that all the bevels were on the front side of the cross, the mass was there as a result of cutting it with a chisel. And on the sides that I didn't have to move, you get some more little facets and some things that make it look better, I think, than if you bandsaw it or do it, use an angle grinder. It is a bit more precise to use a bandsaw, so that would be the craftsmanship of certainty, and a chisel would be the craftsmanship of risk, but it's entirely up to you. And if you're thinking about doing a bunch of these, you might want to do some test pieces just to get all your sizes and your proportions exactly right, and doing those under the bandsaw makes a lot of sense because you can cut three or four of them out in 15 minutes, take them all to the fire, open them up, see what you get, compare the lengths, but make sure you take notes, and then see what you got, which ones you like, and then once you would settle on something, go to the chisel for the final product. I've made these from starting material as small as half inch square bar, or about 13 millimeters, and I've done them up to one inch square bar, which is, what, 25 millimeters. Just depends on what you want, what size you want, all the proportions are up to you. There's probably a good ratio for the how tall the bottom of the cross should be compared to the lengths of the arms. Perhaps the golden mean ratio is good for that or something out of the Fibonacci series. But that gets into design stuff and this was more about technique. So just do what looks best in your eye. And then if you don't like it after you're done, do it different the next time. No big deal at all. Anyways, it sounds like it's starting to rain, which is really odd because it's early March and March should be one of our snowiest months. But it rained last night. It's raining again today. Heck, it got up almost to 60 degrees today, which is really weird for March. So before it rains too much harder, I'm going to pack up the cameras and head for the house. I hope you enjoyed the video. Give it a thumbs up if you did. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button down there. Feel free to stick around, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends. But then by all means, try to make time in your day to get out to your shop, make something. But stay safe, wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one. If you would like to provide financial support for the videos here at Black Bear Forge, there are links in the video description for both PayPal and Patreon. These are merely donations, the content is free, and will remain free.